Plaquette here with Focus Forward, and well, I have a really exciting show today. I have Daniel Francis here from, via satellite from Amsterdam. Very excited to see. Dan, Daniel is the author of The Cold Call Bible, which is a fabulous book. If you, ha if you um, ever need to do any cold calling, this is the best thing that you could possibly get for it. It has total strategies in that on how you can develop relationships immediately, as soon as they pick up the phone. And who doesn't need that if they're cold calling? And I have Wendy Burrell here. And Wendy has a BA and an MA in psychology. She comes to us from Silicon Valley, 18 years in the technology sector. I am excited to be having this show today. So, Wendy, how are you? I'm excellent, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, and we have Daniel here too. I'm excited to be here with Daniel. Yeah, isn't that great? Okay, so now, what are we gonna um, what are we gonna talk about today? I know we want to talk about relationships, doing business with different cultures. I know we want to talk about psychology. I know we want to talk about all this. Yes, definitely. Well, I think the thing for me that's interesting is people always ask, the first question that people ask me is, how do you get into technology with a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in psychology? And how does that work for you? Um, where you're in this technical world with a psychology degree and aren't you upset that you don't use that technology degree every, every day? And my answer is, I use that degree every day. I use it in relationship building. I use it in the way that I helped to build teams, um, to help teams work better, process improvement. There were so many ways that I used that education in unconventional ways. And I actually did a lot of testing in Silicon Valley um, with relationships to see how things would work well and how some things maybe didn't work as well. Um, and internationally as well. So um, I worked with really big companies. I worked for Yahoo for eight years. And I had the opportunity to work with global teams as part of that position. And so I've learned um, some things in my experience, how to work better across global teams um, and also um, how women in the workforce are a little bit different than men. And so I'm, I'm excited to, to talk about some of those things with you today. Well, great. I can't wait. Daniel, don't you wish you had a degree in psychology, even just one? Um, yeah, it would be very nice. <laughs> oh, wouldn't it be Lucky. nice? <laughs> Sorry? Well, wouldn't it be nice to have that degree in psychology? Uh, absolutely. I mean, can you give it to me? <laughs> I think we have to go to school to get that. Okay, so um, Daniel, you do business in other countries w across cultures. So tell us a little bit about that. How do you develop those relationships? Um, well, depends on, of course, which countries uh, I do business in. Um, but um, for a, I, I live in Holland, um, and uh, Europe has 27 countries. Um, which all have a different culture. And if I would um, uh, approach a German company, usually um, it's a very formal way in which I approach them. So if I talk to a Spanish company, it is a less formal way if you start to, to be formal. So anyways, you have to know how to uh, adapt and be very adaptable to these various cultures. So this is something you more or less learn here in school. That's where you learn it. So you learn to do business or learn to develop relationships with other countries right in school? Well, you learn from a very young age the difference in cultures in school. Now, I use that particular part, of course, in business. And of course, you learn things, but it is uh, absolutely uh, so that in uh, our elementary school and high school we learn about the different cultures. How do the French eat? How is the French culture built? The history? And of course a lot of this history between France and Germany, uh, Spain is involved already for centuries. Versus um, the United States which is quote unquote 200 years old. A little bit <laughs> okay, all right, all right. We're, so we're young. So, Wendy, mm -hmm. can you imagine how fabulous it would be that if we were able to learn in school how, we do, how to develop relationships and the customs and the cultures of 
you know, other as countries. Daniel was saying that, I was wishing that I had that in school because because we didn't get that. Um, at least where I grew up in in the Bay Area in California, we didn't get that. But I think what I did get in California was more of a melting pot. So in in the Bay Area, we definitely did have influences from different cultures. So I think that. Growing up in the Bay Area, I'm uniquely different than a lot of people across the country that, um, you know, if somebody grew up in Texas, for example, they may not have had, and I say Texas because I live there now, so, uh, but if there's people that grew up in Texas, for example, they may not have had the diversity that I was able to have in the Bay Area and California. So I, I think that um, it's the exposure to those other countries and cultures that's important and understanding how to respect and value everybody's each individual culture and traditions and holidays and, and those kinds of things. But I would have loved to have gotten that in school, as Daniel mentioned. Yeah, that would have been fabulous to have in school. It's unfortunate that, uh, or maybe they're doing that more with, uh, you know, the, the kids that are in school right now. That would be, that would be excellent learning. So when, um, so when is, we're, we're, we're doing business in other countries. More and more, even small businesses are doing, are doing business in other countries. We, maybe we didn't have that education in school. How do we hit the ground running and develop those relationships right away? Either of you. Well, uh, that depends on um, uh, um, uh, the cultures that you, you, you go to. For instance, take Asia. We learn have uh, the, 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 a bit about the cultures of Europe in our schools, but Asia we learn a little bit about, but if you really want to know more about that, you need to take extra courses and uh, uh, maybe really take a study on that. I have never done that. Um, now, uh, still, I am doing business um, with China, for instance, um, and the way I do that is in, in my opinion, a pretty easy way, but it's also a way that lots of companies do it. China is so uh, incredibly difficult to get your foot on the, on the ground and, or, and really make it happen there. You use an agent. Mm -hmm. And that is the way I have learned. You go with an agent and the agent teaches you what to do and definitely what not to do. Okay, so, so I'm going to touch on the psychology of relationships a little bit about that because it's exactly what you just said. Even in any role that you're in, find the expert because it's impossible. I mean, even with the internet today, it's easy to find answers to things, but there's so much information out there that you can never know everything that you need to know in order to be successful. Um, I'm a proponent of continued learning. By all means, continue learning, continue reading, continue networking and making relationships. However, find an expert in whatever role that you're in, whatever you're trying to do, find somebody that's an expert that you can attach yourself to so that when you need something in that area, you have somebody to go to. So for example, if I wanted to learn how to be better at cold calling, I would call up my friend Daniel and I would say, hey, I have a call that I need to make. It's really important. It's a high pressure situation. What tips can you give me? Or do you have some skills or suggestions? And so now I have a connection with a friend that will tell me the insider track. And I don't need to know everything about cold calling then, for example. I think that's a brilliant idea. So, okay, so one of the, one of the steps that we're getting here and the tips is go to an expert, okay? Don't be afraid to, to seek advice from an expert. I think that's brilliant. The other thing specifically about China is China is huge and there's so many different cultures within China. So when you're looking for, for that expert, you want to do business in a certain area, it's important that you have that person that is familiar with the culture in that particular area. So that's another thing. Okay, so for instance, you've done a lot of business in India. Correct. Ha Daniel, have you done business in India? No. No, not yet? Okay, so let's learn a little bit about doing business in India. So why don't you tell us about that? So when I was working at Yahoo specifically, I had um, teams that I was working with in um, Bangalore. And in working with them, um, their holidays were different. Um, their communication styles were different. 
Um, working with men and women was different as well. And so there were a lot of things that we had to learn as a team in order to work more effectively. Uh, one of the things that happens when there are remote locations is a lot of the us and the them. And so what I have been trying to do by utilizing that psychology degree in Silicon Valley is to minimize the us and the them that happens within a, cult, within a company um, across cultures. And so it's uh, about building relationships. It's about finding the expert in that other country, for example. So there may be somebody um, in Bangalore, for example, that does something better than somebody in the States would do. And so it was about building that relationship um, across the, the globe so that you had somebody that you could go to and then foster the we, right? So it's it's less about the us and the them and then it's more about the we. And teams are always more successful when it's a we relationship as opposed to an us and a them. Well, wow, that's great advice. Okay, so what you do is you're going to basically compromise. Compromise between the different cultures as opposed to saying, okay, we're the parent company and this is the way we want it done and we're, we need these, these people out here to do it exactly as we want it. What you're saying is you create more teamwork by creating this concept of we're working together on this. I absolutely, Brilliant. I absolutely agree with you, but I also think it's about finding people's unique skills and talents and abilities. Um, so in the example that I gave, I happen to know that Daniel is amazing at cold calling. So I look for skills and talents and abilities as I'm meeting people, and then I remember who's good at what so that we can go back to them and say, you know what, I know that you're really good in this particular area, and I need somebody that's really good in this area. Can you explain it to me? Uh, for me, because I wasn't um, extremely technical, I have, as we mentioned, psychology degrees, um, and I'm working with people that would have electrical engineering degrees, for example. And so I would need to know something about a filer, computer system, network, data center um, that I didn't know in detail. So I would find experts in those areas when I needed more information in those technical realms. Um, and I relied on them as partners. And so it's about building partnerships, and I think Daniel mentioned that earlier. Yeah, so that's, that sounds great. So um, what do you find is the most, what do you do when something goes wrong? You know, what do you do when, when maybe something, somebody's not doing what you need and there, maybe, maybe it's a difference of them not really owning up to the fact and you, you know, what do you do? What do you, how, how do you make that work? Well, for me, it's about asking questions. You, you just have to ask the question. Um, did I misunderstand? A lot of times um, across geographies and across different cultures, there's just a misunderstanding that's underneath all of it. And so um, I don't know if Daniel has a different approach, but for me, it's always just asking the question and saying, did I, did I misunderstand? Uh, were we not clear about deliverables? Um, was there something that happened? Um, a lot of times, culturally, different cultures are not as expressive as folks in the States are. So I find that folks in the US will, will be forthcoming and say, hey, I missed a deadline or I'm not gonna make it, where it's seen as um, shameful in some other countries to, to miss your deadline or to not be on target. And so they're less willing to come forward with it. Um, or they think that you wanna hear yes. So they'll tell you yes, even though they can't deliver. And so it's about brokering that and understanding what's exactly underneath it. So what do you think it's, about I, that? I agree with 100%. Um, and it's funny actually what you mentioned, where you said um, American very, very, being very expressive and everything and, 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 and stuff like that. And, and you see, there are plenty of people that have the idea that our Americans are even not that expressive as, for instance, the Dutch culture would like them to be, or the German, straightforward, uh, don't give me any BS. So what I'm hearing here, and that's, that's pretty funny, probably a lot of business people in Europe and in the States will look at a, a country like Japan or Korea, where they will say yes, yes to everything, but in their minds, they have a different plan. And then I'm sure between the US and some um, European countries, they also have all, always differences. So therefore, indeed, communication is key. And I completely agree. Always think from out of yourself. What did I 
do wrong or what can I fix? Right, because we really only can control ourselves. Correct. So what do you see about the differences of doing business as a European in the U.S.? Because we are very ethnocentric here in this country, and we're always thinking about the, doing business with them. But what about you doing business with us? Well, um, as I lived in, uh, in New York, um, I have noticed what it is to do business in the U.S. Um, well, for me, I've learned, the, the, the main thing that I've learned is um, from out of the, um, my European well, European, my Dutch culture, because as I said, we're 27 countries and Europe as a European Union may exist, but it's not like the United States where pride is something very strong. So from out of, from my, from out of my Dutch eyes, um, I noticed, for instance, that I needed to be on top of things to get things done in the States. Mm. Where and, and and I hope I'm not uh, 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 insulting anyone, but I'm just telling you my vision, what I have, what I've learned. Whereas in um, uh, a a um, German, Dutch, um, British, Austrian, where they say they do it, usually gets done. And I don't need to be on top of things as much as I had felt when I was doing things in the States. So do you think that, that's a, that there's a difference in the way that we view details? Because I think that Americans ch tend to leave details, I, I, I'm oversimplifying, of course, but many Americans tend to leave details a little bit like they're gonna work themselves out as opposed to specifically dealing with every single detail initially when you make you know, the arrangement, do you think that that's one of the differences? That could be, but then, and then I had a nice discussion uh, actually uh, with some people that told me, and this of course I don't know, but I just take it as an, uh, that, that it might be the case, where there is a um, big difference between doing business in um, Washington, New York area versus um, the Californian, San Francisco, Los Angeles area, where there is a difference. I don't know if you 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 two agree. With so, what that. do you think about that? I, I think there is a difference for sure. Um, in the states, we tend to work, 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 and and there's a, a trend actually where people are not taking their vacation. Um, they're compiling all of this vacation that they don't take. And um, actually, I've heard it several times where, when I've been in, in the Silicon Valley area where I hear people complaining about the, especially the Europeans who really know how to take vacation. You know, they'll, they'll shut down for six weeks. And it's, it's completely unheard of um, in Silicon Valley to, to shut down for six weeks to be with your family on vacation. Um, and so we long for that, I think, but are not, often not balanced enough where uh, work and home life, I think, are, are not necessarily balanced, specifically from my experience in the L.A. and the, the Silicon Valley areas, for sure. I do think it's a little bit different there. Well, that I, I, I completely, uh, there are great things in the States. I mean, I love the States, um, but indeed, um, I do believe we think indeed differently here in Europe. I mean, most European countries have, uh, people have 25 vacation days. And some, they, they, they take three weeks indeed out, and some, indeed, there are some companies that are shut down for six weeks. Um, uh, usually there are sort of construction, uh, in the construction uh, uh, companies. Um, and it is, it is true, there's a different, um, thought a different mentality versus the states, mm -hmm. um, and even uh, the states versus Asian countries. Because in Asian countries, it is also work, 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 long hours, but family is very important. So, in looking at it, do do we see a difference in productivity through this? Like, we're work, 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 work. Are we really as productive, say, as 
people in other countries that may work less hours? Like, are we really that much more productive is, a, is an important question. I would say busy uh, work. Busy work is my answer, that, that we're um, overloaded now with Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and all of these things that are now part of our jobs, our daily existence that we're checking in and we're connecting with all of these people, which is fabulous. But I've heard so many people just be overwhelmed by email, right? So they're not necessarily productive because they're spending all of their time answering emails in a one-off fashion as opposed to spending you know, 20 minutes attacking all of the email that they have to answer all at once. They tend to, in my experience, run from one thing to the next to the next. And so I don't know that anything gets done effectively. Um, it could probably be much more effective. So Daniel, you were going to say. Absolutely. I, I agree with you. And, and um, for me, and then it goes much quicker. Um, I use the phone. Um, a simple thing. Everybody emails, emails, emails. I'm thinking, why? In a conversation of one minute, I can talk all things through that would talk, take me usually 20 emails forward and backward. And those are small little things, but those are already um, things only in behavior between people. Then we have behavior between um, uh, companies, the same company across the globe. And then we have cultural differences. So yeah, adapting is the trick, I think so. So how does one, how does one really adapt, you know, on the fly, that moment? How, how do you, how do you do that and, and really still get what you need to get done, done. Like how much energy well, is that taking? How do you do it? Well, the way I do it is I'm open. I'm open, I have to think, if I'm going to another country, then I need to respect those, those laws, those cultures, and therefore I need to be open. Okay. And I don't go with the mindset of, I'm going to be Dutch in this country and they need to adjust to what's in my mind. Um, and I think when I go into companies, uh, into countries and to talk with companies that are from a different culture, this is the way I think. And this is the way how I have gained success so far. Okay, so what do you think about that? I think it's about creating trust. Um, so we've been talking about relationships. It, it really all boils down to creating trust with people. And so if you trust somebody and have a relationship of trust with them, they're more likely to say yes and mean it. So we were talking earlier about saying yes and not really meaning it. If you have a relationship of trust with somebody and they say yes, they're more likely to deliver. And if they find that they can't, they're more likely to tell you that they can't, which is just so much more productive. Well, that sounds like another good one, is to develop a relationship that's based on trust. Don't we all want to do that on a regular basis with everybody? So that's really important. So the next thing is, um, you know, we're here, we're, we're, we're on the ground, we're, we're, you know, trying to develop these relationships. How does one actually initially start those relationships? Now, for Wendy, she came from a company, there was already that structure. With Daniel, you're actually making those calls, is that right? So how Absolutely. do you develop those relationships? I, I, I make those calls to, to, to various countries and um, uh, absolutely when I uh, uh, try to get in a company uh, uh, like in Spain, for instance, I know not to aim right away for the, uh, the CEO, it doesn't make it doesn't make sense there. You need to become become friends. You need to build your relationships. It's a different story in Germany. You, no problem. You uh, to to call some high manager, uh, sales director, or COO. But I've learned in Spain and also in France to do that differently. Um, in Japan, Korea, well, actually, any most Asian countries, it's the introduction. Um, come or 
go through someone from the embassy that knows someone wow. that usually works very well. Wow, that's great. All right, well, we're wrapping up. These minutes go so quickly. So, um, Wendy, what do you have us? What do you have to tell us? Three tips that we can use, maybe in the technology sector, to develop those relationships quickly. One, network. So, create relationships with people and stay connected to them. Um, build trust with them. So, if you say that you're going to do something, then actually follow through and figure out who is the expert in the area so that when you need them, you can leverage them as long as they're still in your network. If you're maintaining a relationship with them, it should be easy to go to them to ask for a favor when you need it. Excellent. Okay. Danielle, give us three very hot, quick tips that we can do, that we can use. Um, culturize, educate yourself. There's lots of stuff on the internet. Read it so you have a clue. Be adaptable, be open. So that means put your own thoughts out of it, like I'm going to another culture, therefore I'm going to be adaptable to what's going to come. And um, uh, uh, three, um, humor. You, you have to be careful with it, but definitely use humor. I, wherever I go, Russians, Greek, Americans, humor does uh, always uh, put a smile on people's faces, and it, it unites. Okay, and thank you. And if I can just say one thing, I think the most important thing um, for me is to go getting ready to have fun, getting ready to meet a whole new group of people, and really seeing things almost like a child. Because when people see that you're excited where you are, you want to know, you want to see, and that you think it's really interesting and beautiful, that really helps. So thank you so much for being on the show. You guys are great. It's been wonderful. Daniel Francis in uh, Amsterdam and Wendy Burrell here with me. And uh, tune in again for Focus Forward. Thanks so much, and I hope you enjoyed the show today. Hey, I'm Robert Dempsey with your tips from the net, and today I'm here to tell you to get mobile, and this is why. So I saw two recent reports. The first one was from Yankee Group that said there are currently one billion worldwide mobile users. So that's across the entire world, obviously. Um, a second report by Comscore, which said that now one in eight U.S. internet pages, when they are viewed, the page views are done on a mobile device, whether that's a... Uh, like a mobile phone or a tablet computer. So the trend is clear here. Mobile is coming out in a big way. And you know this for sure when you hear about Facebook getting smacked around in the world of PR because they came out with a mobile app and it was horrible. According to the people that used it, they really didn't like it and they got panned. So that's a mobile app. But you know, going back to your website, you need to make sure that your website does work on mobile. So how do you do this? Well, if you have a WordPress website, there are multiple plugins that you can use that will create a mobile optimized version of your website. Now, if you are creating a new website or doing a website refresh, then you wanna use something called responsive design. Don't worry about what that means. Your designer will know what it means, but effectively really what it means is that you can code the website once and then as the screen adjusts, the screen size adjusts, the content starts moving itself around. Very cool. So ultimately you don't have to use any fancy plugins or anything like that. You code the website once and it works on a tablet or a smartphone or a computer like a laptop uh, like this. So that is it for this week's tips from the net. Get mobile or be in trouble. I'm Robert Dempsey and I will see you next time.